Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And and welcome from the ALNAV Secretariat team here in London. Uh, my name is Francesca Bonino. I am the, ref the research fellow here in the ALNAV Secretariat covering humanitarian evaluation. And I wanted to welcome all of you to this first webinar organized for members of the ALNAV Humanitarian Evaluation Community of Practice. We are really pleased. We have over 100 participants from 80 different organizations, from academic institutions to UN NGOs and uh, uh, several participants from, uh, from Red Cross uh, um, Red Crescent uh, societies joining us online. And uh, we are really uh, glad to have the opportunity today to discuss and explore a topic that uh, um, ALNAP network members have discussed for quite some time as it is something um, that preoccupies a lot of the evaluators uh, um, in different organizations as they are working to strengthen the capacity to commission, conduct and use evaluation more, effect uh, more effectively in humanitarian organization. So this is our topic today and we will present a very simple and accessible framework um, that looks at evaluation capacity and this will help help us framing the conversation. The framework we are going to use today is presented in the ALNAP study using evaluation for a change and we are going to share the study and the, the translation in French and Spanish after the webinar so you can share it with your colleagues. Perhaps let me start uh, from colleagues here in the room. So I already introduced the Francisca Orfalo who is um, uh, the online uh, chat uh, moderator uh, with us today. I also have uh, here in London Alistair Hallam. Uh, he's the author of the ALNAP study we are presenting today. Um, he's the director of Valid International um, and he's an economist and a medical doctor by training. Um, he has over 20 years of uh, humanitarian um, work experience and he has written widely on issues relating to humanitarian evaluation including a very influential guide from 1998 on evaluating humanitarian programs in complex emergencies. So welcome Alistair and thank Thank you for, to be, uh, for being with us. Um, and let's move now to the virtual uh, webinar room. Uh, we are very grateful to have uh, um, two excellent discussants who, who are part of our community of practice. We have, uh, we have Wartini uh, Pramana from Canadian Red Cross. She's joining us from uh, Ottawa and she's the um, evaluation manager um, uh, for international operation at Canadian Red Cross. She has been in the position since 2007 and previously she has been working in the field for several UN agencies, multilateral and bilateral organizations and she has a background in psychology and business. So welcome, uh, welcome Wartini. We will be hearing um, uh, from her about the experience in Canadian Red Cross uh, uh, in strengthening um, evaluation. Uh, we are also very glad to introduce uh, Mikkel Nedergaard from uh, Danish Red Cross, um, uh, sorry, Dan um, Danish Refugee Council, sorry. Um, he's joining us uh, from Copenhagen and he's the monitoring and evaluation advisor at uh, Danish Refugee Council. Uh, Mikkel has been working uh, in project management, assessment and evaluation for more than 10 years and he has a, a extensive experience also in emergency response coordination including with Danish Red Cross and he has a background in human geography. Uh, they are both a member of the community of practice and they have agreed to share with us some experience in their uh, agencies that how they have worked on uh, strengthening evaluation capacity. So this is the first uh, quick round of introduction and I wanted uh, now to jump straight into the evaluation capacity framework which is a very useful uh, tool we thought, quite accessible and quite intuitive and helpful to frame the conversation and guide us to focus on three capacity areas that are mutually reinforcing and all um, equally important to support the capacity of individuals and team to commission, carry out and deliver evaluation products that are high quality, relevant and usable to feed into decision making. So for us discussing evaluation capacity um, is a way to understand also which factor promote and inhibit effective use of evaluation in humanitarian organization. 
And uh, when we were working on this, on this study, uh, what we reflected on with Alistar is that indeed evaluation, if used effectively, they can become a powerful vehicle to identify lessons, generate compelling evidence on what works and why, and also introduce and sustain changes and improving performance. So what makes this, this study and also this, um, this simple framework quite unique is that we really wanted to have a, a framework that is accessible to a non-specialized audience and we wanted to showcase in the study some concrete examples and insights from evaluators in the ALNAP network on what they have done concretely to support evaluation use, to foster ownership of evaluation processes, and also, perhaps, and this is more subtle, to decrease the perception of evaluation as a criticism, and also often as a top-down extractive practice that is often perceived as being disconnected from decision-making processes. So if you download the study uh, on which, uh, from which the, this framework is taken, you will see there are more than 20 insights from evaluators uh, and throughout the ALNAP network. And what is interesting is that they come from different positions. We have insights from staff working in donor organization, commissioning evaluation. We have insights from evaluation managers or evaluation consultants who carry out evaluation in the field. So you can really appreciate a different perspective and different entry points that organizations have been taking um, to support evaluation use. So I'm going to now give the floor to Alistar, and he's going to take us very quickly uh, to explore uh, these uh, three capacity areas, and we will then give the floor to Mikkel and Wartini so that they can share their experience uh, um, in working on this uh, um, uh, very rich uh, um, portfolio in their uh, respective organization. Uh, so I'm handing over the floor to Alistar. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to quickly go over the main um, capacity areas. They're hierarchical in nature. Uh, so the first capacity area is leadership, culture, structure, and resources. And these are the bedrock of any process to strengthen evaluation capacities. Starting with leadership, the research that we did for the paper showed that this can be one of the ways of having the most profound change in an organization. Uh, but can be difficult to achieve. What can evaluators do? They can find and support evaluation champions within their organization. They can seek to appoint senior staff with responsibility for evaluation. Uh, but what they must do is engage with senior management and meet their needs to highlight the, the value, the potential value of evaluation within that organization. The second area is culture. And encouraging um, an evaluation culture means becoming a more self-critical and learning-oriented organization. This means making space for staff and programs to discuss program quality and performance, including critical elements and failures, and framing evaluation more within a learning and improvement paradigm, and less with top-down mandated accountability. So, Demand for evaluation needs to be stimulated throughout the organization at different levels. And one should expect programs and interventions to be planned, designed, and monitored in a manner that was conducive to subsequent evaluation. How do we build an evaluation culture within an organization? There's a number of ways. One needs to decrease the perception of evaluation as criticism. Perhaps this means linking findings to other more general evaluations to show that criticisms are not personal. Rebranding evaluations. Be flexible, have fun, highlight successes, um, make the reports more lively, and use other media. Structures. Different organizations require different structures. A small NGO, it might be better for the evaluation office to be close to the programs and less structurally independent. For a large UN organization, where there are huge differences in power and perception between the layers of the organization, a more structurally independent office may be required to be able to tell truth to power. And finally, within this capacity area, resources. So the studies have shown that the three most significant barriers to evaluation are the lack of staff time, insufficient financial resources, and limited staff expertise in evaluation. So the most important resource for evaluation departments is their personnel. But these are not always well supported. 
it can be seen as a bad career move. This might not be the right thing to say in, on this particular webinar. Um, but sometimes the incentive structures of agencies do not necessarily reward those in the evaluation department. DFID has recognized this recently and made um, evaluation a profession in its own right. Moving on, capacity area two looks at purpose, demand, and strategy. So first, it's important to clarify the purpose of evaluation. Is it accountability, audit, and learning? It needs to be articulated, and one needs to be aware of the tensions between these different purposes. Secondly, one needs to increase the demand for evaluation information. Strive for stakeholder involvement, whether affected people, country officers, managers, and then ensure evaluation processes are timely and integral to the decision-making cycle. Um, as one manager says, part of the art of evaluators is to scan the horizon and anticipate those issues that will be of concern in the future. And finally, within this section, develop a strategic approach to selecting what should be evaluated. Um, in the paper, we talk about CEDA's evaluation planning cycle which starts with a conversation with all the units about the sort of um, knowledge they want to know. This generates a, a first set of ideas which are then sifted through and whittled down and a smaller, a smaller number of evaluation projects are then chosen. And in that process of sorting, reference groups are formed who then help manage and follow through those evaluations. On to capacity area three. This is about um, strengthening uh, the follow-up and post-evaluation processes. So first of all, pre-evaluation processes. There's no need to rush into an evaluation, but instead one, one has to think, what are the needs? What data is available? What resources do, do the evaluation team have? And how can these be combined to produce the final output that is useful? One then needs to work on improving the quality of evaluation. This can mean limiting the focus of the evaluation and do less, better involve beneficiaries, think about quality assurance processes, and encourage peer review of the evaluation function. Disseminating of findings is another huge area, which I won't go into now, but an evaluation is not just a report. It can be many things, workshops, videos, use of social media. Indeed, dissemination needs a strategy of its own right from the outset, and not just once the evaluation is finished. Strength and follow-up, and post-evaluation processes and link evaluation to wider knowledge management. So ensure there's a management response and ensure that people afterwards have access to and can search evaluation information. Finally, conduct meta-evaluations, evaluation synthesis and reviews of recommendations. There's a high demand for such products. So for example, ALNAP had many downloads of its work on um, earthquake responses after the Haiti earthquake. Some organizations periodically go through their evaluations and try and pick out common themes across all evaluations and then highlight these as areas for to, to do further work on throughout the organization. I think I've spoken enough and I will pass on to some of the other participants before the floor is opened more widely. Thank you, thank you, Alistair. Uh, thank you for, for the overview on the three capacity area. Let me just uh, perhaps conclude uh, while we are on capacity area three, which is the one on evaluation processes and system. Perhaps let me conclude with one of the points that was highlighted uh, during the consultation with ALNAP network members as a critical ingredient to support the use of evaluation, which is about the quality of the evaluation product itself. Of course, there are systems and structure leadership support which is of course very critical but the evaluation product itself um, should we should also strive for a credibility and for greater quality of what is generated of the evidence that is generated through um, through those products and uh, here one of the most recent and perhaps most helpful uh, resources um, in the sector is actually coming from a recent study uh, conducted by ALNAP where um, we have been looking at which criteria could be helpful to look at how solid, robust, and indeed credible is the quality of the evidence that we present in an evaluation report. So there is a reference
difference in there, and we are going to share. Um, we are going to share it um, with the with the participants. Um, we are going to share this uh, this resource, and uh, perhaps we could consider um, doing a follow up webinar to delve more in depth on this um, on this issue. But there is uh, definitely an attention in the sector recently to promote systems that look at quality assurance for evaluation processes as well as product. So um, this is a new area where there is an increasing work being commissioned and um, uh, it could be perhaps a topic for, uh, for future webinar if, if there is an interest. The last point uh, is a point that Alistair already touched on, which is definitely the attention also um, to the software element related to communication and dissemination. And perhaps uh, 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 Mikkel from from DRC is gonna is gonna mention a few of the new and perhaps perhaps even more creative solutions to try to disseminate and make more accessible um, uh, the content of of evaluation reports. Um, let me also perhaps conclude before passing on the floor to the discussion and mention another great resource for those who have not uh, uh, already used it, which is the ALNAP Guide on Evaluating Humanitarian Action. It is in a pilot stage, but it is interactive, it is available in French and Spanish, and it is the most comprehensive and sort of step-by-step -step, uh, guide and reference, uh, reference text that covers all the steps in an evaluation, from the decision to commission the evaluation, all the way to uh, managing the fieldwork, the selection of consultants and then when it comes back to the organization and we take it through the, the management response and follow-up. So these are two, um, two uh, tools that we wanted to, to highlight um, and that we will share um, as a follow-up to, to the webinar. So this concludes our, uh, our section um, with the presentation on the framework and uh, we are ready to move on now to uh, the discussant and we thought to start with Mikkel in Copenhagen who is going to uh, tell us a little bit more about the Danish Refugee Council experience in strengthening monitoring evaluation and a learning system. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Francesca and thank you Ella for giving me the opportunity to share some of our lessons learned here on our process on strengthening the evaluation capacity in Danish Refugee Council. I will I'll try to uh, highlight some of our key uh, lessons learned that will speak to the presentation now made by Alistair and Francesca and try to show a few of the, the solutions that we have, we have tried to, to pilot in this regard. But to start off with, I'll just give you a brief uh, introduction to the background of, of the process that I'm leading here in the Danish Refugee Council. Uh, the Danish Refugee Council has grown quite rapidly in terms of funding and field presence during the last year and that has led our organization to have a focus on, on strengthening and having more clear support and policy structures in place globally. And of course among that is the monitoring relation and learning as we call it. So it's been a, a strategic priority in the organization from 2013 until 2015 to look into how we can strengthen our MEL uh, framework. So what we've been doing so far is to, during the last uh, 12 months, is to conduct an inception study where we have tried to map out uh, the current evaluation capacity and the current use of evaluation in the organization. And um, by doing that, we have, we have of course, uh, identified a number of challenges and uh, let me try to highlight a few of them that are relevant for this conversation here. The first one that I would like to touch upon is uh, referring to uh, uh, the capacity area one on leadership. Um, we have found that the management, the top level management throughout our organization is actually very supportive of our efforts to strengthen uh, the use of evaluation and there is a willingness to go in and, 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 and try to support and see how we can make more of the evaluations that are already conducted. However, we have found that, that we in some way lack structures that can actually keep them engaged. So what we have been, been trying to do is to build on the processes that we have that can tie the top management directly into the use of evaluation in our organization. So the reason for this is that as it is now, evaluation in the Danish Refugee Council have, has to a very large degree been uh, very much a field 
based exercise, and there's, we have lacked kind of clear linkages into the global level. So what we have tried uh, to do here is to look into some of the, the structures that we have in place and that have the attention of, of our senior management and look how we can strengthen the use of valuations around these processes. For instance, in the data review council, we have some key planning events. Um, at the country level, for instance, we have what we call annual reviews. And at the global level, we have an annual director's meeting. Like in both these events, uh, there is the opportunity to create a space for reflection and learning through the use of duration. And the annual reviews at country level also function as a, as a session where lessons learned are picked up and further feed into a meta evaluation that's then conducted at the annual directors meeting, at, which is a global meeting. But of course, there's always like a battle to get uh, topics on the agenda for these kind of uh, events in the organization. So what we have tried to do in this process of strengthening the use of evaluation in our organization is to carve out a more clear role um, in relation to the use of evaluation at these key events in the organization. So it doesn't become uh, something that's lived up for the decision from, from event to event, but it's something that is actually a mandatory part of these events. So that, that is one, one thing we are trying to, to address and move forward with. Another thing uh, that I think Alistair was, was also mentioned was uh, to have you know, a more strategic use of evaluation in, in the organization that kind of give uh, the top management a, a way to direct uh, the resources that are spent on evaluation. And here we are introducing the use of key evaluation questions as a way of directly involving the leadership in setting strategic direction for what some of our evaluations should be looking at. And the idea is here that the senior management group will you know, participate in formulating and as well as deciding on some key evaluation questions that have a global re uh, relevance for the organizations and that can help again structure this uh, process around our meta evaluation. So it's, it's a way that we hope to address this about uh, the limited resources that we have here in head, head office for evaluation and at the same time make more use of, of the evaluations that are already conducted and ensuring that they have strategic relevance for the, the organization globally as well. Another issue uh, I would like to touch upon is um, related to the third capacity area on uh, evaluation processes and systems. And here um, the background to this challenge is that we in the Danish Refugee Council is a very decentralized organization, also when it comes to our M&E processes. It means that, that often we find that the M&E systems that we have in our organization, they can differ between country, they differ from country to country. And therefore we often kind of lack maybe a lack of common standards within M&E in regard to the use of evaluations especially. But at the same time you know, that this has been highlighted in, in our consultations with, with the field and head office staff during this last year, what has also come out is that while there is a clear need and wish to have more guidance and more standards, there are also a clear want to not have more SOPs or a more bureaucratic uh, process around uh, M&E. Often what we hear is that you know, staff think that they do already spend enough time on monitoring relations, so please don't make it more complicated than it already is. So, you know, we of course see a need and also have the acceptance from management to impose, you know, more standards that can make it more streamlined and the way we use evaluations, but at the same time we can of course risk losing the support to this project of strengthening the use of evaluations if it becomes too SOP or too control heavy uh, the structures that we build up. So at the moment we don't really see any easy way around it. Uh, what we are trying to do is to ensure that we in our process of strengthening uh, the use of relations don't uh, create more M&E processes but build on, on what is already there. So try to ensure that we are making more and better use of the relations already conducted.
So not more m and but more relevant m and In addition to that, we are trying to ensure that the results of the relations, they become more visible in the organization globally. This has also been a clearly identified need we have had. And here we have recently launched, I think what Francesca mentioned, was recently launched this four-page that we call an evaluation and learning brief, which you can access on our homepage. And that is like a small format that tries to capture key findings and lessons learned from some of our larger evaluations. And with this, we hope we can uh, engage uh, more of our staff in the process around evaluations and also in some ways showcase to the organization, uh, to our organization, what, what the results of evaluation can, can produce and create like a positive identity around the use of evaluation. So with that, I will uh, give the floor back to uh, Francesca and Vatino. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikkel. Um, very clear, uh, very concise, uh, and um, and the content-rich uh, uh, insight you gave. Uh, I picked few points that I think uh, could be quite interesting uh, for participants, perhaps also to reflect on a few points that I picked from Mikkel's presentation that I thought are particularly powerful. Are the point uh, um, about trying to tie evaluation work to existing processes, so to anchor. Uh, this line of work uh, in other processes such as, for instance, uh, uh, processes that are field-driven such as the annual review or, as uh, Michael was mentioning, the annual director meeting, which are global events that happen periodically and try to get uh, um, evaluation on the agenda and make it a stable feature of conversation both at field level, so to acknowledge the decentralized nature uh, with which evaluation work often happen in the field, but also acknowledge that we should also um, look at the link between uh, the decentralized uh, evaluation and many work in the field with, uh, um, with conversation at the global level. So these are just few points that I took note of and uh, uh, perhaps we can go back then uh, when we open the floor for, for more questions. Uh, and now if we can cross the Atlantic and uh, reach uh, Wartini in, uh, in Ottawa, uh, we should be able to um, have then the other account from uh, uh, Canadian Red Cross and their experience with m and &E. So this is Wartini Pramana and thank you for the opportunity uh, of sharing the uh, experience of Canadian Red Cross. So uh, can, uh, the international operation of Canadian Red Cross is uh, started to systematically work on strengthening our offer process of uh, evaluation in 2007. So and I, I was the first uh, focal point for evaluation back then in 2007 to now. So this is what I learned from 2007 to now. What things that help us to promote use of evaluation? First, we are lucky enough that we have champion among decision makers who can advocate use of evaluation with their peers. So the role of the champion here is really critical to put agenda of the evaluation into their uh, whatever meetings that senior management have. Every year, the senior management have a list of evaluation that is going to be conducted for that, that year. And they will choose which one they want to discuss in their meeting, including the not just the report, but also the management response. So the role of the champion is to remind uh, their peers and keep keep them on track about the plan that, you know, which evaluation we should discuss and so on. The second one is that we are also fortunate to have in, in some of our program where donors are really interested in being involved in the evaluation. So we plan evaluation together with the donors and they're also interested in getting updates of the follow-up on action on the management responses. And this is of course increased the attention of the senior management on the overall evaluation process. And this is also normally happen in the, our high level program or our projects. Then, uh, then it took us. Then it's about tracking of the follow-up action on the management response. We have quite. Uh, I'm in our uh, uh, Canadian Red Cross International Operation. We have the development program and we have the uh, emergency and recovery program. So, and it's, it's a lot. We have a lot uh, program in so many countries. Most around, I think we work in around 30 countries. So we've been trying to 
find, okay, what will be the system to track that uh, follow-up, what is about the status of follow-up action of all this management response. But for the management, what works is when they select just um, a strategic follow-up action that they would like to be reported to them on a regular basis. We also have we also done meta analysis of all all evaluation to understand what areas in the organization wide have improved and what areas remain to be addressed. So the recent one we did it from we look at the evaluation report from 2005 to 2013, and we, and then after the report is available, I presented to different department, including the the business unit, of the logistic and human resources and so on to come up with a recommendation from all the stakeholders about what we can do about this and then we're going to bring it to the senior management response, you know, uh, the report and the, uh, the senior management team. So we're going to present the report as well as the management response. And lastly, we now experimenting with how to make the recommendation to be more uh, relevant to us. So. Uh, we, I got this idea from my, my participation in the American Evaluation Conference when we are debating about the role of the evaluators in providing recommendations. And one of the ideas is, is to say that we should limit the responsibility of the evaluator in gathering and analyzing evidence, and then the recommendation should be done by people who are concerned. So this is what we, now we are trying to experiment with this in two ongoing evaluation. Now, uh, but the challenges uh, in using the evaluation, I think it's, it's like everywhere, is that in humanitarian organizations, we often tend to be more action-oriented instead of learning or reflection-oriented. And we have to be busy sometimes to cut off of the time to do this. We're always competing with conflicting priority and demands of the decision maker and program managers. And the other big challenges that we have that I see is that uh, I think there is still a need to educate public and donors about giving incentives to organizations who are transparent about their failures and learn from them instead of being punished. You know, so an uh, example of this is uh, I think the uh, uh, publication of failure report by the engineer with the borders is an amazing uh, exercise. Now I go to the what helped me, what helped us to, uh, to stimulate demand for high quality evaluation. Again, for the Canadian Red Cross, the presence of some decision makers who really believe in the importance of having high quality evaluation really helps because it helps with, because we have the quality assurance system in the overall processes, but the presence of the decision makers of that, you know, help us to enforce it every day. And that's the same like any other organization, but for every evaluation, we have a, a, a team who provide oversight in the overall of evaluation process. And we've been very fortunate that we are given this team often, uh, this team often uh, comprised of me and program managers and uh, our implementing partners. And so far, I feel like we are given the authority to select qualified evaluators and we can demand about the use of uh, robust network evaluators. Of course, we have to be realistic in this, in the expected standard, and I would also like to take this opportunity to um, congr congratulate my, some, uh, my, my program teams who have been open to the ideas about, you know, oh, we should have a, a, a peer review from our staff or, you know, so it's been, so it's been, it's been a good so the last one is that what is important, what is uh, important is the availability of good evaluate, uh, good quality evaluator. Because this is this is help to show that evident informed evaluation can be done. So and it doesn't have it doesn't always have to be done by international consultants because we recently we had a very good uh, solid report from Sudan by local consultants. Now, the challenges that I still have is that uh, in Canadian Red Cross, we still have, we don't, we still struggling to have a common understanding about differences between technical monitoring, 
learning and accountability oriented evaluation. Some people believe that evaluation is for sending technical experts or operational people who've been working in that field for long to do evaluation. Often these people, what they do very good, they're very experienced, but they don't have the skill to gather evidence. They don't know about evaluation methodology. So that's why the, the report is often opinion based. So I think this is uh, in the field of uh, evaluation, I think a, there has been a debate about the need for certification of evaluators. Like Canadian Evaluation Society actually has certification system for evaluators. So I don't know if it's something that the uh, uh, evaluation in humanitarian um, field would like to take up. So, um, so the first challenge leads to my second challenge that the staff who define evaluation as technical monitoring are often reluctant to allocate time and, and money for the evaluation because they do not understand that it takes time and resources to have a good design evaluation and also to adequately get the and analyze evidence. And my last challenge in this is that we started doing uh, internal, more internal and horizontal evaluation when we used peers. And sometimes we, sometimes we have uh, people who have evaluation background or research background so they know how to gather data, sometimes we don't. And I believe that we, uh, if we use uh, peers or internal evaluators, we still need to, uh, we cannot have uh, a big difference between quality of internal evaluation and external evaluation. So I think if we use internal evaluators who don't have the uh, evaluation, uh, the needed evaluation skills, they still need to be trained and guided. I think that's all for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Martini. Uh, again, uh, another very interesting, a very uh, dense uh, account of uh, Canadian Red Cross experience. And here again, perhaps let me highlight uh, just a few points I took note. Um, and uh, a very, very interesting, very re refreshing actually uh, to hear that there is a, a space in Canadian Red Cross, for instance, for champion uh, for senior leaders in the organization to promote and uh, as what Tini was saying, to perhaps remind uh, different teams and different corners of the organization um, about the role uh, that evaluation and learning can play and the commitment to allocate time and make sure evaluation is in the agenda um, and is follow up to. So uh, at one point I picked up definitely the, the good experience um, uh, of working with champion within the organization. Another point that perhaps is interesting and would be, it would be good to hear if other participants online have some experience. Um, the role that donor can play perhaps uh, in a joint evaluation or in, um, in follow-up to evaluation. How do you keep uh, donors in the loop uh, perhaps for those high-level programs as, uh, as Wartini was mentioning, uh, programs that perhaps um, are uh, involving the, the, the whole organization and uh, where there is an interest from, from different and departments, for instance, or how do you keep um, donor uh, donor informed? Another point, uh, perhaps also quite uh, uh, quite interesting to to uh, note down, is the one about the increasing interest uh, of uh, using internal evaluators. So evaluation uh, work has become less monolithic as it used to be, perhaps up, uh, until uh, 10, 15 years ago. So there are different type of evaluation, including using mixed teams, so internal and external evaluators. Um, working together, but then the question, which is an outstanding uh, challenge for, for many organizations, is how to ensure quality when we use uh, different uh, um, different evaluation exercise and mixed team, for instance, um, and how do we work to get a common understanding across uh, uh, the organization of the, the the role and use that evaluation um, evaluation can play. So these are just few few points I picked from. Um, uh, from your contribution.
Yushin Wartini. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, both Wartini and uh, and Mikkel. And now we have um, we had a few questions that participants who registered for the webinar uh, emailed um, to us uh, when they were registering. Uh, the first two question you have on the screen were questions that were emailed um, to us from a colleague. Uh, an MNE advisor working for Christian Aid in South Sudan. And we grouped a few questions uh, that you were sending us. A lot of the questions were actually relating to recommendation, how to craft recommendation uh, in a way that they are more actionable and more likely to be used. And uh, interestingly, both uh, Mikkel and Wartini were touch touching on this point. So this question comes from a colleague in, in South Sudan and also uh, from uh, colleagues uh, who are following us from uh, Madrid working in Dara. So this is this was a question they asked. So um, how uh, would you suggest uh, um, that recommendation can be crafted so that they are more likely to be used and followed up? And the, another interesting follow-up, uh, what about when recommendation target implementing partner, when we work with implementing partner? So that was the first question, and um, Wartini was uh, introducing what Canadian Red Cross um, experience has been to limit the responsibility of evaluators to the evidence uh, gathering and analysis, and then leave the recommendation to be discussed in a, in a workshop uh, uh, setting. Um, I'm not sure if Wartini want to add a few reflection on this um, on this point. I think that, that, that's all. I think that's, uh, yeah, even with implementing partners. We did try that also, we have evaluation, we, you know, uh, uh, in, in the field we, we always say at the end of, uh, at the, end of the um, evaluation, stop at the findings and then, um, don't, uh, and then we have, we, we have a, a quite, a, a, when they have this, there's time, you know, so you give them enough time for people who digest the finding, you know, so that the people have to, to receive the report first, right, to see what is the finding, and then they can come and do the workshop and have, uh, and, and, and discuss whether they even accept the finding or not, or they, you know, and then they, they can um, formulate the recommendation together with the implementing partners and whoever involved, you know, because in my case it could be the HR, it could be the logistic people, you know, whoever that would, that would be implicated on that recommendation. I think that's all for me. Uh, th thank you, Ortini. Um, I recall that uh, uh, there has been some experience uh, and some experimentation, perhaps, uh, using a similar approach uh, um, some years ago, also from from the part of uh, of donor. Um, so some years ago, I think Echo for some evaluation was suggesting was suggesting also uh, a similar approach. Perhaps uh, uh, one other experience I could um, I could flag is the one um, uh, in the context of real time evaluation. So uh, I would like you know to take the second point of the question about uh, recommendation when we work uh, with implementing partners and recommend recommendation are targeting them. So in the case of real time evaluation, um, a lot of emphasis is placed on the in country validation workshop. So before the evaluation team leaves the country, there are a series of evaluation of validation workshop with different stakeholders, including very importantly with the local authorities, for instance, could be representative of uh, national disaster management authorities in the sub-office or provincial level. And uh, recommendation that target in implementing partners or other uh, stakeholders, including um, local administration, local authorities, are discussed in these validation workshop, which are facilitated at the local level. So this is um, at the provincial level, for instance. And recommendations are usually left in a draft uh, stage discussed uh, um, uh, openly in a, in, a, in a workshop setting and uh, are produced in a very uh, timely manner. So instead of uh, uh, being discussed when the evaluation reports is um, um, presented to the to the headquarters or to the commissioning agency. So there is a lot of emphasis in making sure that recommendation that targets implementing partner, especially in contexts that are 
operationally very very fast paced as in the case of humanitarian operation um, inside an onset um, uh, um, disaster and emergency for instance the recommendations are discussed on the ground uh, as the evaluation team is still there to make sure that are relevant and timely so perhaps I wanted uh, to, to add um, this additional point. Um, I could see actually from the online um, on, from the online chat um, that uh, one colleague, um, uh, Michele Mercier, uh, was actually um, making an observation um, about the importance of having a proper knowledge management. Um, systems um, so that not only we are producing uh, recommendation and producing uh, commissioning producing evaluation but there is also a way to make sure that knowledge uh, is circulated in the agency and there is also institutional memory um, about uh, evaluation and the lessons that are presented in evaluation and perhaps uh, um, the point about working with knowledge management system and information management system is one where perhaps I could ask uh, Mikkel to share some of his thoughts because I know in in DRC they have been um, they have been reflecting on how best to go uh, uh, about this and considering the importance of um, knowledge management system to support the um, evaluation function. Yeah, thank you, Francisca. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to answer that, but but you're you're definitely right. It's a, it's a topic that comes up again and again in our discussions in the Swift Council. How we can manage better to share knowledge and 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 kind of map the the knowledge and expertise that's within our organization. Being very decentralized is a key challenge for us to to create some kind of system where people in the field actually knows what other people in other country programs know. So, and it's not like that we have a, a, a solution for that at the moment, but we will definitely uh, try to move towards having a, you know, global focal points from for some of these areas, uh, our, some of our key uh, uh, working areas, and that will be also in the lead of, of ensuring that, that there is a, a systematic uh, 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 picking up of lessons learned uh, from the field level and, and to the global level and the sharing and again that is where this uh, evaluation and learning brief that I mentioned before we see as, as a key vehicle to kind of uh, ensure that knowledge um, is shared in the organization and, and just one more comment on, on, on this that is related to what we talked about before uh, on um, uh, the, the use of uh, you know recommendations from evaluations and the follow-up up to them. Uh, I, I think, and that's nothing that we've been discussing, and I think you also touch upon it in, 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 your, in your manual, is the thing about maybe we should try to look more into following up later than just the management response to the evaluation that comes out. So what we'll be trying to do is to, you know, go f a little bit further than that and actually to see, you know, half a year later, so what's actually happened with the, with the recommendations? Have they now been uh, filtered into uh, the design of the uh, new projects? And and see how can we, we we actually document that? I know that some donors today actually uh, demand that you show uh, the evaluations that have been done in a certain particular area, uh, how you use the recommendations from these evaluations in designing your new project. But doing something like that in a more uh, Structured manner is something that I think can can help also develop a you know more uh, uh, concrete and, and 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 useful recommendations from evaluations. So thank you. Thank thank you, Michael. Um, thank you for your contribution. Um, I'm really I'm really glad that uh, on the topic we are we are uh, uh, we are seeing being suggested in the in the online chat. Uh, we can have uh, different different contribution and different different perspective. And as Michael was saying, uh, for a lot of uh, uh, this work, uh, it's very much work in progress, and uh, um, there is not uh, one size fits all. Uh, approach that we can draw from, uh, but uh, it is interesting to hear how different organizations are approaching from different angles. Um, perhaps uh, to take uh, um, uh, to take another question, uh, and, and this is actually an interesting point, a reflection that Annie Davenport uh, from UK DEC uh, here in London, she's offering a, a reflection about the experience of working with mixed teams. So Wartini was bringing up the um, uh, the 
contribution uh, from Canadian Red Cross reflecting on the, um, on the need and perhaps the opportunity of using more internal um, evaluators uh, and using mixed team. Uh, what Annie was suggesting um, is to share the reflection from the DEC commissioning work in the Philippines uh, uh, following the um, um, Ayan and Yolanda um, uh, typhoon and uh, she uh, was describing the evaluation as being a, using the setup of uh, an experienced um, uh, team leader and then a very skilled um, uh, local local consultants and uh, they have uh, um, together this is a set of skills uh, was uh, was um, was contributing to um, evaluation evaluation report that they believe to be of high quality and useful for them. And uh, we have uh, Alistair here in the room, and he could also uh, and he was suggesting he could also contribute some reflection on the use of mixed team and using an um, external independent uh, uh, team leader for evaluation. The issue of mixed teams came up a number of times during the uh, writing of the paper, um, and I think it's an excellent way of building capacity quite quickly and easily. Um, so firstly, field uh, staff often feel a little bit frustrated when an external team comes and does not know much about the context, the organization, what's possible, what was not possible, and then this external team take all their knowledge with them when they leave. Uh, I must say I've also found, I've been on evaluation trips, fascinating evaluation trips, learned a huge amount just wished that other people could have been with me on that trip to see what I've been seeing. And while I try and communicate those findings back at the end, there's nothing like actually being there to learn about the evaluation process yourself. So I think a mixed team is, is, a, is a fantastic idea. Um, having an external team leader, perhaps, who can provide independence and quality assurance, but then bringing along um, people who have been working on the response from, from local organizations or, or who've just been present there um, gives them that evaluation experience. They see what it's like to ask questions of beneficiaries. Sometimes they visit communities they've never had a chance to visit before. They see, they see the results of the evaluation and it means they also bring the context and information necessary for the evaluation with them. So you win in all, in all areas. They, they build their awareness and expertise of evaluation, the evaluation team benefit from their understanding, and the quality isn't um, impaired because you do have still an external independent uh, team leader present as well. So I think it's well worth um, doing more of, and perhaps you know organizations evaluating each other's work uh, as a great way of just building up the evaluation culture and getting more people involved in the evaluation process. Uh, thank you, Alistair. Thank you for, for sharing uh, your perspective on this. Uh, perhaps I could suggest uh, now to have uh, uh, to make a shift and to move uh, uh, to another question uh, that came from uh, one of the participants who registered online uh, working for Oxfam. And, uh, and the reason why I thought to select this question is because I know that uh, uh, both Mikkel and, and Wotini uh, have uh, spent considerable amount of time um, thinking uh, and uh, uh, experimenting uh, with, uh, with this type of evaluation. So we are talking about RTE, real-time evaluation. The question that our uh, colleague from Oxfam was asking was um, uh, since RTE are becoming more widely used and, and, and popular, uh, was asking whether there has been a review on how effective they are and what would make them, um, and what would make them better. So perhaps I could offer a quick observation, a quick answer to this, and perhaps opening up to a more general question and asking uh, perhaps Mikkel, since I know the RC has been thinking about uh, uh, using, experimenting more with RTE, what is attractive, what is innovative of RTE for those organizations who perhaps have not been using them so consistently as, as some other. Uh, before moving, before, however, passing on the, the, the floor to 
um, to Mikkel. Um, a quick question to this. It's a very good. Um, it's a very good question. And RTE have indeed become popular, but there have been already. Uh, they have been around since the uh, since UNHCR first in the in the in the mid 90s uh, started uh, uh, to develop this this new concept. And to answer your question precisely, there has not been, to my knowledge, a, a proper review or sort of a, um, a comparative study on the use of RTE in the humanitarian sector. However, I can point out to two um, resources. Uh, the first one from UNICEF. There has been a review of the RTE experience in UNICEF done in 2003 and we can share this. It's one of the few examples I know of an agency taking stock and then publishing um, a, a, a comprehensive account, a sort of a meta-analysis of RTE including their quality, their use uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, which area of program they covered and all of these questions. The review, however, is from 2003, and I'm, I'm not aware there has been a, a more updated version. But there is a, a more update, a, a more recent resource that could be quite helpful uh, for all community of practice members to go back and have a look. It is actually an article uh, recently uh, uh, published in the Canadian Journal of Program Evaluation. We have it linked on the COP, and it has been um, authored by Ricardo Polastro. Uh, who uh, used to be with uh, with Dara and is uh, currently with IOD Park. It is a very interesting and uh, very recent article published about a month ago, and it is interesting because uh, Ricardo pinpoints the development of RTE since the mid 90s, how they have been used, what are the main features, and what seems to be strength and weaknesses. And it's quite interesting because he also offers some sort of a timeline describing the evolution of this approach and this of this type of evaluation. And so I thought to um, uh, uh, to mention those two resources, um, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of a general question on 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 RTE, perhaps asking Mikkel um, and then to Ortini, what is attractive for organization when they think about RTE? Uh, what makes them uh, uh, attractive and um, and willing uh, and the agency and, um, are willing to uh, to give it a try if they have done, not done it in the past? I thought this was a good question to uh, move back to our discussant. Uh, if Mikkel, you want to take the floor? Yeah, thank you, Francesca. No, I can. It's right that we have had these, uh, or we actually in the middle of 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 of, of uh, piloting ITs as uh, part of our, you know, uh, emergency response setup now. And I think the attraction to us is to, of course, have something that can go in at the earlier stage of the response where things are often very messy and actually try to uh, come up with recommendations already there where it makes sense to have uh, someone for the outside maybe a view on, on, on what can be what can we do to be more effective and efficient in in our response. So so that is you know basically the idea. And then I also think that for some in our organization, it also seems, you know, to be an, a type of evaluation that is maybe more manageable in some ways, even though it comes in at, at, a, at a time in, in the process where, as it said, you know, everyone is, is often very, very stressed, and it, it's, it's, it's a, it can be a, a messy time of the, of, the, of the operation, but it's also there where, where you know, input is, is most needed. So uh, that, I think, is, 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 is definitely the attraction and, uh, and why we want to, to pilot it. And then, uh, uh, just as a remark, uh, we are very much actually inspired by the way Oxfam has uh, used uh, real-time evaluation and been looking into to their system and try to learn from that. Uh, thank you, Mikkel. And uh, I wanted to ask whether Wartini also has a, a reflection on, on real-time evaluation based on uh, Canadian Red Cross experience. Uh, for the RTE, what we're trying to do now is that uh, we, uh, we, we're trying to have the RTE to have also good quality. So we're trying to have uh, you know, standardized uh, TOR inception report data collection, and we try to train uh, some of our people, uh, internal staff, to to conduct it. Uh, so that is in in the plan. I think that's yeah because we we often, you know, yes, RTE is is, is rough and dirty, but we still like to keep you know to maintain certain level of quality. So we'll see how we go with that. Thanks. 
Thank you. Thank you, Martini. Um, and thank you for the question and comment which are coming coming in. We had uh, um, we have um, Kasum Diallo who is reminding us um, of the importance of evaluability assessment. Um, it is a um, it is a point that I think we touch perhaps too much. Uh, just on the surface uh, in the ALNAP study, um, they are, uh, in our view, they are not that, that common or that often used in humanitarian evaluation practice. But indeed, when Alistar was um, talking about the importance of pre-evaluation pre uh, uh, support, uh, that is the sort of exercise that could be quite helpful, uh, and especially in uh, evaluation that look at, at more complex issues of, or for instance, uh, um, that put an emphasis on a, a longer term, um, on outcome that could be visible on a longer term, for instance, if we are looking at, at protection. Um, and I know UNICEF has had some experience on availability assessment. We could ask them to um, share some resources online in the community of practice. So uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Kasum, for, for, um, for, your, for your comment um, uh, there. I would suggest perhaps to move towards the close of the, of the, web, uh, of the webinar. Um, but we wanted to reassure you that we have not lost the track of the other question that you have asked and we are going to um, uh, try to compile them and see whether we could organize uh, a follow-up webinar perhaps uh, uh, dedicating more time just on a cluster of questions on a specific topic. So a lot of questions were actually looking at more technical aspect of evaluation. Many questions you sent us were actually looking and um, asking for uh, suggestion or comment on different type of evaluation design, uh, a lot of questions were actually looking at impact evaluation, some of you were asking about randomized control trial and how applicable they are or relevant they are in uh, evaluating humanitarian action. And so perhaps in closing this, um, in, in closing this webinar, uh, let me just uh, um, give a quick reminder of where you can find uh, some resources or meet your colleague virtually to discuss those issues. So for all of those, uh, for all of you who have asked question related to uh, humanitarian impact evaluation, RCT and different type of design and feasibility of humanitarian impact evaluation, uh, I would encourage you to uh, just log on or click on the community of practice link, which is the partner platform.org slash ALNAP humanitarian evaluation. There is a, a nice uh, think piece, if you will, um, from Jo Puri. Uh, she's the executive director of the 3IE Secretariat based in Delhi, the Secretariat for the Initiative, International Initiative on Impact Evaluation. And she has uh, written a think piece for the community of practice just delving on uh, um, humanitarian impact evaluation. And so you, that is a useful way to start the conversation and, um, and we will organize uh, um, later in September a webinar uh, focusing on, on, that, uh, on that topic as we know there is a lot of interest. Um, other questions were actually relating to um, suggestion and reflection on how to engage affected population more effectively in evaluation processes. And we have two suggestions on this topic. The first one is, uh, and we are going to share it, is to go back to uh, um, the paper that was commissioned by ALNAP uh, in preparation of the annual meeting on engagement of affected population in humanitarian action. Uh, evaluation is just, uh, uh, is just a wedge uh, in, in the topic, but uh, there, is a, uh, there is a discussion in the community of practice and also a, sec um, a, a chapter of that paper that uh, delves uh, on uh, uh, engaging affected population in, uh, in evaluation work. Uh, we are also discussing these days in the community of practice, uh, the topic on how to ensure the quality of the evidence generated through participatory approaches. Uh, and you, if you are registered to the community of practice, you will receive uh, in your inbox uh, um, a little think piece contributed by Jessica Alexander, who is uh, discussing on this, uh, discussing this, this topic uh, specifically. Uh, so I thought that this little housekeeping uh, final, um, uh, uh, final information to share, and I hope hope you have enjoyed this first webinar and I definitely encourage you to um, get back in touch if you have a topic or a, a speaker you would like to see featured in a webinar um, to uh, get back in touch with me or Francisca. 
Um, so with this, I would like to thank Alistair here in the room, uh, Francisca who has moderated the online chat, and especially uh, Wartini in Ottawa and Mikkel in, uh, in Copenhagen for having been with us today. Uh, uh, thank you for your support uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again virtually in the community of practice. Um, and that's all for, from London. <laughs> Bye.